and welcome to OVA Hour. Um, I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member here at the Buck Institute, uh, and I'm really excited to bring you a special guest today. So um, if you've listened to OVA Hour before, you know that um, here at the Buck Institute, we're pioneering a global movement to advance scientific research around reproductive longevity in women. Um, that's because reproductive decline in midlife is about far more than fertility or menopause. It's something that impacts every aspect of a woman's life, her career, family, health, well-being. Um, and it's really something for us that's about equality. So uh, in 2018, we started a center here at the Buck Institute to tackle female reproductive longevity. And it was the first facility in the world to focus solely on this topic. Um, and our goal really is to try to understand what causes reproductive decline in women and to try to find ways to intervene to slow it down or possibly even stop it. Um, and when we started the center, uh, we, we realized that to strengthen and broaden our reach, we really wanted to do something that was much bigger. And that led us um, in partnership with the Bia Echo Foundation to found the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. And this is really an intellectual network of scientists, both in academia and and industry and biotech all over the world. Um, and our goal is to bring together everyone who has an interest in this space um, to promote a collaborative dialogue about women, about aging, um, and to do to basically to facilitate and to accelerate this research. Um, so through collaboration, through funding, we fund grants and innovation, we're trying to accelerate the pace of discovery towards things that will be beneficial for women. Understanding how and why ovaries age prematurely will hopefully also provide us some clues about aging in the rest of the body. And so as we're building this ecosystem around reproductive longevity and equality research, I have the privilege of meeting and talking with amazing scientists, physicians, entrepreneurs every single day. And this OVA hour is my opportunity to introduce you to them. So today I'm really, really excited to have a conversation with Claire Gill. Um, so Claire founded uh, the National Menopause Foundation. Now, the National Menopause Foundation, I would have thought has existed for a very long time, but in fact, it's only been around for a few years, which is breathtaking. Um, she's also the CEO of the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, which obviously is, you know, clearly related to, to uh, menopause. And so um, I want to welcome her, thank her for joining us. And um, Claire, can you tell us a little bit about the National Menopause Foundation and why in the world did it, did it only get founded two years ago? <laughs> Thanks so much for inviting me, Jennifer. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be here. And I'm just so fascinated by all the work that you're doing uh, with your colleagues. So really love this opportunity to talk with everybody. Um, so like you, I was incredibly surprised to find out that there was not a women's advocacy organization at menopause. Um, I've been working in women's health for about six years years at the time um, in bone in osteoporosis, as you mentioned. And then uh, we were having conversations with colleagues who said they needed to do a project with us because there wasn't uh, an organization, um, an advocacy organization for women at menopause. Um, as there is a nonprofit for just about everything, uh, I found this really shocking. And I did a lot of research on it. And there were a lot of hybrid organizations. There were nonprofit, for profit hybrids. Um, and there were medical organizations like the North American Menopause Society, which is fantastic, that have great clinical information and do clinical training. But what we founded uh, in 2019 as the National Menopause Foundation is an organization strictly for women uh, and their families to learn more about what is menopause? When does it start? How does it impact our lives, as you said? And uh, how do we empower women to make this one of the best times of their lives versus something that is often dreaded? Right. So, and, and taboo, right? We don't really right? talk about it. No one it. talks about it. No one yeah. talks about it well. Yeah. So we launched in 2019, as you said, and we've been building the capacity and growing the organization and doing projects that actually really focused on more of the national level, um, talking with all the women's health offices at a agencies, federal agencies. They all have women's health offices, uh, but menopause falls way down the list of their priorities. Um, so we talked together about how do we make menopause and women's health at midlife more of a priority. And so again, I'm so fascinated to find out about the, the Brink Institute and the work that you're doing and particularly the work that you're doing on, on longevity, every productive longevity and equality. It matters so much. 
Yeah, it's, um, I mean, obviously it's very near and dear to my heart, but I, I, I honestly think that it's something that, it, you know, it's something that we, we should have already figured this out. And, um, you know, the combination of a lack of funding and a lack of really basic biological research on the female physiology has led to the, the place that we find ourselves in now. But the consortium really did start around the same time then as the National Menopause Foundation. And um, part of, you know, part of what we're trying to do as well is, is to get to, to advocate for policy reform at different levels. So when you when you say that there were um, organizations that were hybrid, what do you mean? Do you mean organizations that had a, a component that was a business kind of a yeah a business okay yeah, yeah where they're trying to make some money um yeah I, I so i wanted to point out to everyone who's listening that your website and the resources that you put together are spectacular and not just for women who are at the stage of perimenopause or menopause but for younger women too who you know who want to learn something about their bodies um i've said this before i think you've probably said this before too when we were having a, a chat but when everyone, literally everyone, at least in the US, will have some kind of, you know, sex ed class when they're in junior high or high school, where they learn about, you know, puberty and the changes that their bodies are going through. But there's nothing even close to that for females, for female fertility and for the changes that happen during aging. We just never get sat down and, and told about what's going to happen to our bodies. So can you can you just very quickly just talk about the educational information, the, the kinds of programs and the, I know you have a podcast and a newsletter and <laughs> yeah. a really cool online community and they all have a wonderful, like, I think really inspired names. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, well, we wanted to start again with, with really creating a hub, a place where all women could go and find out the, you know, really scientifically valid information about what is happening at midlife. What can they expect? Um, uh, you know, what are those changes that we hear so much about? I think everybody knows about hot flashes, but most women do not know that there are about 31 symptoms that happen uh, around menopause, perimenopause. Um, and so we've addressed some of those, the most common ones on our website, but we will be doing more to address every symptom uh, that can be experienced at menopause. So as you said, we started the, the website first, and then we do have a podcast called The Positive Pause, where I interview experts uh, on women's health and menopause and anything that's really interesting or um, important for women to consider at midlife. Um, and that can be, again, family-related, health-related, career-related, uh, interesting things about age in the workplace, things like that, that I think women as they approach uh, midlife are looking for more information and you know we want to be a resource for that. Um, we do have an online community, uh, it's free, and that's an opportunity for women to come together and talk to each other about what they're experiencing and talk about things that have helped them get that through or ask questions of other women, like is anyone else experiencing this and am I alone? And so we really wanted a place that was a safe space for women to come and talk to each other about what they were experiencing at midlife. Um, that's called the Menopause Metamorphosis, and it's hosted for free for us uh, on a platform called Inspire. And then awesome. we also um, have a newsletter um, called the Hot Flash, you know, um, <laughs> pretty, pretty common uh, name for a menopause uh, product. But again, I really wanted to just focus on an opportunity to talk to women about what we were doing in the organization and then highlighting interesting things that we're learning about, such as the Brink Institute and your coalition, and, and really bringing them the information that they need on a quarterly basis that just sort of keeps them in touch with us and, and finding out what's happening. Our next phase with the organization is doing um, really detailed educational programs. You know, as I mentioned, there's there's really so many symptoms that happen to women, and you know, we know sometimes we've heard or at least you've seen a little bit, and some most of the time it's joked about um, about women at midlife and and what they're experiencing. But for many women, uh, hot flashes, night sweats, etc., are no joke, and um, and then we we don't really know enough about when that starts for us uh, as women, as you said, all that education that we get about puberty and understanding the reproductive process. And then for women who choose to have children, there's parenting classes and birthing classes and, uh, and all of that information. And then as you said, and then it stops, there's nothing that prepares us for what many women have said to me is far more dramatic for them than puberty ever was. Right, and, something like 75% of women experience at least one uh, symptom, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And if you're, and if for those that are more severe, I think it becomes really very troubling. And as much like you said about, you know, some of the health conditions that impact women, but you know, all of these things are happening and they don't know what's happening to their body because again, no one's told them. So you start Googling some of these symptoms, the things that are happening to you. And so many women have said to me, oh, I was sure I was, I was early Alzheimer's because they had brain fog. Right. You know, they were just sort of experiencing some of those menopausal changes and they couldn't, you know, keep track of things. And they were, you know, they were really getting worried. They couldn't find the right word or articulate a thought. And then really this panic sets in mm -hmm. and no one again preps us for the fact that this is, this is a normal thing that can happen to you while you're having these huge changes in, in estrogen fluctuation. So exactly. we do need to normalize it. We need to provide information for women and we need to really break the stigma about, about menopause and aging for women. Because as you've talked about uh, just in your intro, so many health conditions are impacted when we hit menopause. And so until there is an opportunity to prolong our reproductive years or stop menopause altogether, then we really need to let women know that there are many, many chronic diseases that they will become much more susceptible to uh, when they reach menopause. Yeah, it's really a disservice that's been done by not by not giving people this information. Um, and because it's been taboo, you know, just having a community like the one that you've provided to to for women to be able to talk to each other about what's happening is is so powerful. Um, and the other, the flip side of that is, is to help educate providers, right? Because I know so many women who, who tell me they went to their doctor, they said, I think I'm in perimenopause for all these reasons. And, and they're either, you know, their concerns are swept aside or they're not really given the right information. Um, and that's not because providers don't want to help their patients. It's that just because, you know, there's been, I would say, an absence of information in and training in this in this area, and you know, misinformation comes in and fills the gap when there's nothing there. That's right. um, so, on the side of policy reform and thinking about how to get, um, you know, you talked about how you've you've communicated with um, policymakers and people in positions of power in places where there are women's health organizations. So, for example, the NIH, there's a there's a office of uh, women's health and. Um, and the, the thing that I've noticed is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of connection between them at the different um, organizations, that they're kind of disjointed, um, that they're operating somewhat in, uh, not in concert, I guess. And so tell me about what you're doing there and, and what you envision as, um, you know, something that obviously we've talked about working together on this, yes. um, but what, what do you think should happen right now? Well, as you said, I think there, there is a little bit of siloing among all of the, the federal agencies when it comes to women's health. Um, I was encouraged to find out that they do have mechanisms in place to meet and discuss a little bit more about, you know, what are the different, uh, the different federal agencies doing. And as you said, you know, the National Institute of Health is one. We also met with the um, HHS, with the Health and Human Services, Department of Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. with the Centers for Disease Control, with the FDA um, and with the labor department, believe it or not, every single one of them has a women's office or a women's health office. Um, and they do have information about menopause. Many of them have fantastic resources about menopause. But interestingly, many of them couldn't tell us how many people come to their website, mm -hmm. how many people download their materials, things like this that they don't track. And when we talked about why, you know, menopause is not a priority amongst their, you know, leading efforts, whether it be research or, you know, communication campaigns, you know, the things that they're uh, instructed to do, it is because they are mandated about their focus areas and all their funding comes from Congress. Right. So it, as you said, it's sort of this, this political system that happens that dictates what are the priorities that are going to be, you know, um, influenced and, and studied uh, as as the years go on? And it's all dictated by, you know, by Congress. So it's really up to us as women to advocate for ourselves and to do that, as you mentioned, with our clinicians, as you said, so many do not have the education or the understanding about what to do or what to suggest to women at menopause. So we really need to work on that. And then two, we need to advocate with our legislators and tell them that, you know, funding for research about women's health 
um, across the life spectrum, I'm sure people are interested in, but particularly at, at midlife is really essential and that we want them to direct specific funds to these federal agencies to address some of the questions that we all have that have not, as you said, been answered by clinical or, or biological research and should have been by now. Should have been by now, yeah. And that's the that's part of the gap that we're trying to fill with our funding. And uh, gosh, we 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 would be ecstatic <laughs> if the NIH would would you know would challenge us and provide even more funding in this space. Um, but so coming back to, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about since um, since you you're expert in this field, um, the the misinformation and the common misconceptions about menopause that 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 occur. Um, and particularly around perimenopause. I think a lot of people are confused about what that means and when it might start and how long it lasts. And, um, and I've heard you say before that the labeling of menopause stages and the timeline that we, we talk about, is just, it's just wrong and misleading. Yeah, well, it's confusing. And, and again, yeah, it we're is. doing it based on clinical, right? It's, it's just what the clinicians are used to doing and how they're diagnosing. But when we talk about menopause, what women think of as menopause, when we think, oh, I'm, I'm going through menopause, we're, we're actually talking about perimenopause, we're premenopausal. Right. And, and most women, when I share with them or they come to our website and learn, you know, menopause is the day when your period has stopped for 12 consecutive months. Every time before that is perimenopause and every day after that, you're postmenopausal. Right. So we really, what we think of as menopause is actually all three stages together. What's happening to our bodies as we, you know, end our menstrual cycles. And then again, what happens to our bodies immediately afterwards and all of those symptoms that people experience in between. And as you said, it's very personalized. It's very different. We have averages for everything, obviously. Mm -hmm. So the average age of women in America who, uh, who reach menopause is 51. Right. But women can go into menopause much earlier in their early 40s. Even I'm talking about natural menopause. Right, you know, natural before. menopause. We've talked about this on the on the on the of hour before that that the the normal window spans 14 years. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So so yeah. when that happens for you, so again, if you're told the average age is 51 and so you're you know 43 and starting to have symptoms you don't automatically think it's menopause because mm -hmm. no one's even told you what perimenopause is. Or, or that, that it could be possible in your 40s, right? That you should be thinking about this and, and looking out for it, really. And, and we talked about earlier, what's even more confusing for women is the fact that in our society, we have extended reproductive, reproductive, ugh, reproductivity a little longer um, through, through medical means for many mm -hmm. people or naturally, as it was in my case, I had my first daughter when I was almost 42. And so when that happens, and then a year or two later, you're starting to exhibit symptoms of menopause, it's unbelievably confusing. You're like, wait a minute, I, I just had a baby. Now you're telling me I'm menopausal? That, that doesn't make any sense. And so again, we have to help educate women about what happens, you know, as we reach 40. And, and moving forward. And then also even for women who are, you know, going into menopause for medically induced reasons, right? mm -hmm. that they've had their ovaries removed due to cancer treatment um, or for a variety of other reasons that they had to have a hysterectomy and ovaries removed, then they will automatically go into menopause at whatever age they're at. And there's no resources for them. So we yeah. really have to do a better job of helping women understand their lifetime of health, but particularly after we hit the reproductive years, what happens to us from reproductive through menopause? Yeah, so let's um, just quickly maybe talk about some of the things that happen at perimenopause. So obviously this is a time when estrogen projection is, um, is declining. Um, and so your cycles will change. Um, sometimes they'll get longer, but most often they get shorter. Um, and it, they become really unpredictable, right? And, and sometimes they'll, they'll be ovulatory, meaning there'll, there'll actually be the possibility that you could get pregnant, and sometimes they won't be. Um, and they, they also can be heavier in terms of bleeding. You know, there's, um, I, I, I've uh, had a physician on the OVA hour before, who's wonderful, Lizelle and LaFollette, and she's said um, many times, the only thing that's predictable um, is the unpredictability of what's happening. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And then the same thing. So when, when we're going through it and sort of experiencing it, then you'll have other women say, oh, well, that didn't happen to me. Right. And so then that's even more confusing. 
you know, so again, I think it's sort of letting women know that there's this whole spectrum of things that happen to you. So many women say the same thing. If they've never had a hot flash, they, they have said, oh, I, well, I didn't go through menopause or I didn't experience menopause. I'm just, you know, and it, like, well, you know, your, your period stopped. Yeah. For 12 months. Yeah. You know, well, then, then you actually, you're in menopause, you're, you're postmenopausal. It's happened, but because they didn't experience what they thought menopause was supposed to be hot flashes and night sweats, then even though that is the most common, as you said, the most common, um, uh, symptom of menopause are hot flashes and and white night sweats, um, but then there's so many other things: um, irritability, anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. things like that that have happened to women who were never depressed or had any kind of, of those mental health issues before, and all of a sudden they're feeling all of these things that are new to them and scary and thinking again, that there's something really wrong and just not understanding that it's their body going through this change and needing to adjust. And that obviously there are a million things that can be done um, both through treatment and through natural, um, natural therapies to address some of these symptoms. Um, hair loss is something that women experience. Yeah. Weight gain is something that a lot of women experience. And mm -hmm. sometimes again, Clinicians will say, well, that just happens to women at, at, you know, at this stage of life, it just happens. And so that's something that's, again, you know, people who've been active and fit their whole lives don't want to hear that, oh, well, that's it, you know, just, just get through it. Um, they need to know that this is, this is something that can be adapted and changed, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult. And then again, how do you work with your clinical providers to give you the best option and response to that treatment. Mm -hmm. Our skin changes. Mm. Um, it's amazing what estrogen actually controls in our body. Estrogen is so important for skin. Yeah. I, I you know, I just gave, I gave a talk um, to a, a group of um, physicians who, who work on skin. And um, one of the things I said was that, you know, most of the changes that we associate with aging skin, at least for women are modulated by this change in estrogen. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's active research, you know, in a lot of different areas, um, but particularly around whether topical estrogen might, might be something that would be helpful for skin health. And I would say that the, the jury's out on that yeah. for now. Well, but again, if we don't study it, how do we know? Exactly. So that's yeah. what's really important is that these things are being discussed now and that some of them are, you know, potentially being studied. And then another huge taboo area that women don't talk about besides talking about menopause are the changes to sexual health. Oh, yeah. So many women experience vaginal dryness. Many women um, all, you know, lose their libido. They don't really feel like being sexually active anymore. And that can really impact relationships and to not let women and their partners know that that's, it's natural and that this is what's happening and this is why it's happening. You're not losing your love for your partner or your attractiveness to your partner. It's that you're really, your body's changing and it, and it needs to, you need to come up with new opportunities to handle what's happening with your body and then to be able to continue those relationships and you shouldn't suffer through it. Again, right. vaginal dryness or painful sex is not something that we should have to put up with at middle age. You know, there are things again that can be done that will address these. But if you don't have someone to talk to, if you're not able to talk with your friends, your family, or your, you know, your doctor, your provider about it, then it becomes really, you know, um, impactful on your life. And so again, there are many more symptoms, sleep deprivation, uh -huh. you know, and as I mentioned, brain fog, things uh -huh. where, oh my God, I forgot that word, you know, and it, we again, attribute that to age, but oftentimes really it's amazing how even our brain is impacted as we're going through this change. So yeah. if let women know, then they can seek out what they need to address whatever symptoms they happen to be experiencing. Exactly. And, and it really is something where reproductive health um, in women especially is so, it's so variable between individuals. This is a place where, where personalized medicine and, you know, really understanding what your body is going through and and working with your providers to get an, you know, a treatment plan that's individualized for you is so, so, so important. And of course, you know, I'm a neuroscientist. And so this is what we study um, is, you know, signaling from the brain to the rest of the body and in particular ovaries. And all of those symptoms that you're talking about are really, you know, they're attributed to the fact that ovarian function declines and all of the hormones um, that ovaries make that are really important for general health contribute to all of these, these symptoms. Um, and I always 
try to point out to people, you know, the part of the brain where those, where the circuits that control reproductive function are located, that's the same part of the brain that has all of the circuits that are important for circadian rhythms, for body temperature regulation, for energy homeostasis, for fluid homeostasis. And when you start to think about then menopause or actually all of female physiology through the lens of the brain, suddenly everything starts to make sense. If you think about the things that happen during puberty, if you think about the things that happen to a woman's body when she's menstruating mm -hmm. um, in terms of water weight gain, in terms yeah. of mood changes, right? And this is also the part of the brain that controls emotional states. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, being able to to treat these things is really important. So for perimenopause, there's no real standard of care. Um, so, so what do you, what, what kind of advice do you give to women who think they're experiencing perimenopause symptoms? As you said, unfortunately, there isn't really a standard of yeah. care. Um, the North American Menopause Society does have some great, great guidelines and they have a whole program to train clinicians who are interested in learning more and becoming mm -hmm. more um, adept at working with women at menopause. But, but really right now, how many, how many providers are there that have gone yeah. through that program? Not very many, right? Right. There's thousands that have gone through that. And there's at least 1.3 million women who reach menopause every year. Yeah. It was so like something not, like what's not going to do it. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I think is, again, is trying to empower women and educate them and give them the, the tools they need to be able to take it to a provider and say, this is this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the one of the main ones that caused a lot of controversy and that we're still debating today, unfortunately, was um, there have been studies about women's health. And one of the biggest one was the Women's Health Initiative mm -hmm. uh, that came out you know, 20 years ago and mm -hmm. um, studied, we're, we're starting to look at women's health and starting to look at it over a longitudinal period, right? Yeah. Looking for it a little more long-term. Great, this is what we need, this is wonderful. But as with so many of these types of studies, they started to extrapolate data that they were seeing on the population that they were, you know, um, working with, and um, and then big headlines came out of that. And so yeah, there were. It was. I would call that a misinformation campaign. Um, <laughs> uh, it was really something. We did. A, we actually did a whole over hour on this, where I took apart the the study and and really tried to explain how we evaluate data, what the data actually said. And, you know, there were flaws in the way that they set up that study. The, the, you know, the average age of the women that they were looking at was I think 62 or 63. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are many things about the study that were flawed, but then also the headlines that came out actually didn't reflect what was in the data. It was just complete, it was a complete mismatch of reality and, um, and the headlines. Um, but it really, I think the WHI study when it, when it came out initially, I think it it really derailed positive treatment options for a whole generation of women. It absolutely did. Because overnight people, doctors stopped, stopped prescribing HRT or hormone replacement therapy, which, you know, I think is, I don't know what you think about this, but I would say it's probably the best treatment option we have for, for women um, to, to treat the symptoms of menopause and potentially to help mitigate some of those dramatic health risks that, that occur after the ovaries stop working. That's right. That, that's absolutely right. And as you said, and, and having spent most of my career in public relations, it's even more frustrating to me to see how some of those headlines, as you said, were manipulated just to kind of get the best headline versus the real data. And, yeah. and as a lay person, I have to say, that's one of my largest frustrations working in the health field as I've learned more about it and seeing how scientific research come. And as you said, no, no consumer knows how to look at a meta-analysis or a scientific study and determine again, what were the, you know, the entry points, what were the endpoints looked at, all of those things. But many clinicians don't either. And they go uh, with yeah, the headline right. as well. And so like you, we've looked at, at least on the bone side, you know, how do we do training to remind, I mean, you get a little bit in medical school about it, you know, mm -hmm. you know how to remind them about how to evaluate some of this data themselves. And then also working with, with, patients themselves to figure it out. But when it comes to the Women's Health Initiative, as you said, so we realize then now, all these years later, that as you said, the the, the specifics about hormone release, replacement therapy were focused on women like 65 and above who would have a greater risk of breast cancer. That's what I've heard. It's yeah. caused heart disease, it causes breast cancer. And it turns out for women at menopause age at the 50 year range, there was no significant increase in their risk for, for breast cancer. And as you said, hormone replacement therapy, besides alleviating some of the symptoms, also helps to deter some of the other chronic 
diseases that can occur when we lose estrogen. Yeah. Bone and osteoporosis being one of them, which we'll talk about a little more mm -hmm. uh, uh, later. But, you know, again, as you said, there's a whole generation of women who then did not have estrogen for a decade earlier than all the generations before who were, you know, taking hormone replacement therapy. And now they're suffering more with bone loss. And yeah. so many women say to me again, I want to make that decision right? I want to weigh the risk, you know, my thought, my risk tolerance for, oh, hormone replacement therapy might give me, you know, this disease. Whereas if I don't take it, I'm definitely going to lose, you know, bone and I'm going to end up with osteoporosis. I, I want to make that decision. Right. So what I'm frustrated with, and when I talked with many of the women's health offices about is where's the big campaign <laughs> a, a, a new information campaign that says, because they've all, oh, they've, women's health centers come out and said, oh, we were wrong. And here's what it is. And this is fine. And now, you know, doctors are slowly, at least those who specifically work in menopause are coming around to, oh my gosh, yes, you know, we can still do this. And the other thing to know is again, over the course of the last decades, there have been updates and changes to how we present estrogen to women, yeah. you know, it, there are different mechanisms for it now that there weren't before. So it's really important that women talk with their clinician about that and not be scared off by the headlines from a study from 20 years ago yeah. and really learn, you know, what does it say now? And if you talk with any of the leading researchers, scientists, clinicians who are working in menopause, all of them will say hormone replacement therapy is safe under certain circumstances for the right group of women. Exactly. I can't, I cannot agree more. And as for who's going to, who's good, where's this um, information campaign going to come from? It's going to be you and me, and anyone right. else who wants to join us where, I mean, this is something that we, we are really trying to push forward. And, you know, I would say when I, we, I don't want to spend the whole hour talking about HRT because we, we, right. we've talked about it a lot, but I do think that, you know, now there are physicians who are adopting this. Um, it, one of the issues around HRT is that it's often applied like a sledgehammer. It's one size fits all, same thing for every woman. And like you said, there's there's lots of new data out there that suggests that you know the amount of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, testosterone replacement is so important for sexual health. Um, uh, those, you know, those three things uh, that the amounts that I might need when I'm in menopause will be very different, um, than the amounts that you might need. And that's something that a lot of physicians don't fully appreciate. And so being able to tailor the therapy to the individual is so important. So I've been really heartened by, um, we had, we had some guests on, uh, a, an over hour previously who started a telemedicine company around HRT, whose only goal is to try to personalize that care. Um, and to, you know, and they're willing to work with women and to pay attention to the, the most recent science that's being published and, you know, to try new things, which I think is so, so needed in the space. Um, so there's, you know, it's looking up, I would say, but there's still a lot of misinformation out there around the women's health initiative study when it was first published. And, um, again, I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, you're not a medical doctor. So all of these things are conversations that people should have in conversation with their, with their providers. Um, but, arming yourself with information um, is, is really, really, really important in this yeah. space. I saw a question too that came in uh, uh, to our chat as we were just talking about that. Like, how do you find someone who, a provider who is specialized mm. in, in menopause? And unfortunately kind of have to do a little digging. Yeah, um, it really is. It's, right? it's so challenging. You can go to, and to, to NAMS, to the North mm -hmm. American Menopause Society and find one of their couple thousand, you know, that there's a person in your area, but otherwise you really do have to just check in with your, your clinician, you know, your clinic or your hospital and ask if there's mm -hmm. someone on staff who has a particular interest or specialty in menopause and working with menopause. Yeah. There's a lot of OBGYNs who are now giving up the OB part mm -hmm. and doing the, the gynecology part, which I also find encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been doing obstetrics their whole life. And when you think about OBGYNs, for most of us, we only consider going to them if we're, you know, planning to have a baby or, you know, going through reproductive years. And then sometimes women stop going to their gynecologist after yeah. a certain year. And I would, I would highly discourage that because again, you could still work with your gynecologist to talk about what, what's happening to me at menopause. And they obviously have a, a much 
you know, greater interest in, in women's reproductive health. And so they might be a little bit more up on it. So again, if you, if you haven't been seeing your gynecologist, um, I, would, I would check back in with them. Um, and if they can't, ask for a referral. Don't be afraid to ask for a referral because clinicians many times have a really good take on who in their community are doing certain things. And any good provider should be willing to refer, to, refer you to someone who is better suited for what you need. Yeah, absolutely. That is 100% so important. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, you're also the CEO for the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. <laughs> so you, you are very busy. Um, so I, I would love to hear what you have to say about bone health. Obviously, osteoporosis, you know, as, as women age and after when they're postmenopausal, um, for healthy women, women who don't have other underlying age-related diseases or disorders, the number one thing that is, you know, that that signals decline in in overall health is bone fractures. Right? It's it's almost like the kiss of death for for a person, a man or a woman, over the age of sixty-five. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about the foundation and um, also about bone health and estrogen? I think. Um, I'm, I, I would love for everyone to understand how estrogen impacts bone health. Yeah, it, it's again, I, you know, it's funny, like you said, I said, the CEO of Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation is my day job. And then <laughs> uh, menopause is my, my passion project doing it. But mm -hmm. there's so many synergies between the two, and it's really important. Yeah. So um, the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, actually, we just rebranded. We were the National Osteoporosis Foundation. So many mm -hmm. people might know us as that, that named organization. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, my frustrations about how little is known about menopause, mm -hmm. you know, there's just a, frust a frustration about how little is known about bone health. It's really incredible that we don't really know what's happening with our bones and, and what that impact is as we age. I think everyone thinks, oh, it happens when old people, they fall, they break something, that just happens when you're old, but that's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. If you should be able to fall, and not break a bone at any age. So really, if you do fracture over the age of 50 from a fall, you need to get a bone density test. It's also called a DEXA test mm -hmm. to find out if osteoporosis might be the underlying cause. And if there's something that can be done about it to stop you from having more fractures. Because once you fracture, the chance of fracturing again goes up three to seven fold. So I have a couple of slides. I'm gonna share my screen if I can. Absolutely, um, please. Um, is it ready? My desktop, share, back them up and where's my thing? There we go. So yeah, I just wanted to click through a couple of things that I thought might be, might be helpful for people as we're talking quickly about bone. So women can lose up to 20% of their bone density in the first five to seven years post-menopause. That is again, completely attributable to loss of estrogen. And that's and right when you should start HRT. This is also something that we've talked about before, but it's so important to remind people that there's a window of opportunity for starting hormone replacement therapy after menopause occurs. And within the first five to six years, it will then have a beneficial effect. But if you, you can't start HRT later, um, it, can, it either doesn't have any effect at all or it can have detrimental effect. So that's, you know, that's right inside the window when you, sh you should be thinking about HRT if, uh, it. if it's again, an option again, for you. you. Preserve your bone health for another decade if you are taking, you know, estrogen treatment. So again, really important conversation to have. As I mentioned, if you fall from a standing height, but now actually clinicians are saying it shouldn't matter. It should be any kind of fall. Even what we think of as traumatic fall, mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't break a bone. And if you do, again, you need to have your, your bone density evaluated. Lifestyle factors can impact bone. I think, um, you know, everything that we do to prevent other chronic diseases is what we need to do to take care of our, our bone health. So you need to eat right. You need to eat a healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables. You need to get exercise. Um, that really means weight bearing exercise, like, and that's on your feet. So like swimming and bicycling, fantastic for your cardiovascular health. They do not help your bone health. You need to have impact. You need to be on your feet walking, running, dancing, hiking, Zumba, anything like that um, is what happens. But there are uncontrollable risk factors too. And I think this is the hardest thing to talk about uh, with women and men because mm -hmm. all people are impacted by bone loss and osteoporosis. The reason we think of it as an old woman's disease, again, is because it happens to more women because of our loss of estrogen at, uh, at menopause, and it happens to us sooner than it happens to men, again, because mm -hmm. of the loss of estrogen at menopause. 
But if you have a small frame, if you're just not a big bone girl like me, if you have a small frame, then your bone density might be a lot smaller than my bone density. So again, you might be impacted by it, even if you've done everything right, which so many patients have said to me, I get enough calcium and vitamin D, I run marathons, I never smoked, I don't drink too much, why do I have this disease? And it's again, because there are some you know, risk factors for it that are uncontrollable. If mm -hmm. your mom, your grandmother, your father, your grandfather, anyone else had osteoporosis, it's hereditary. So there's a 90% chance that you too will suffer bone loss if it runs in your family. So knowing your family history is really important for midlife, just as it is when you're talking about your younger years, when your mom went in, you know, went into puberty, you probably go into puberty, right? Mm -hmm. If your mom, you know, different kind of reproductive issues, you need to look at your own reproductive issues, the same for menopause. So it's really important to think about both the things we can control about our health, bone health and the things we can't. And it is a chronic disease. Unfortunately, there is no cure, which means you're gonna to have to take care of you know, managing your osteoporosis for the rest of your life if you wanna stay independent and mobile and active, which we all do. So those are the things that I think it's really important for, for women to know. Um, we also don't know that bone is a living tissue. Uh -huh. uh, I think that was really kind of a surprise when I give lectures about it. People are like, what are you talking about? Our bone is constantly remodeling. And there's a uh -huh. picture here of this kind of honeycomb looking uh, thing. That's, that's the inside of our bone. That is what our bone looks like. And when we don't, um, when we suffer bone loss, this looks much more broad holes and you know the honeycomb starts to dissipate. And that's what we're looking at when to make sure that people uh, take care of their bone and what their bone density is. As we talked about, menopause impacts that remodeling. Mm -hmm. The breaking down happens, the remodeling and growing back slows. And so again, estrogen just plays such an important role in that for women, but so do again, diet, exercise, mm -hmm. making sure that you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D which is really important. There's so many foods these days that are fortified with vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of easy to get vitamin D intake. Mm -hmm. And we really um, suggest that people get as much of the calcium from their diet as they can. Mm -hmm. You should try to eat and consume all of the calcium you need daily, and then only supplement for the, any shortfall in your diet. And these and, are things that you can, you can ask your doctor to measure. It's not like you have to guess can. about your calcium levels or your vitamin D levels. And I think a lot of people don't realize vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. You know, it's, it's one of these things that, um, it's, it's much, maybe much more absorbable if you, if you take it as a, either in your, you know, as, as you said, um, as part of your diet, or if you're supplementing to take something that would be, um, uh, uh, drops as opposed to a pill. Yep, you can do that. And again, now so much of these supplements do come in so many forms, as you said, that really talk to your doctor. Yeah. I will advise, don't just supplement on your own. No. Uh, you know, again, this is something that like, as you said, a simple blood test can check, you know, your vitamin D levels. Um, I, although I would say the majority of the population in the United States sites is probably vitamin D deficient. So Especially if you're protecting your skin by putting on sunscreen. <laughs> well, again, you know, if we, if we were, if we were in a society that lived outdoors as we did, you know, decades, hundreds of years ago and didn't have sunscreen on for our entire body exposed for 15 to 30 minutes a day, we would absorb all the vitamin D we need. Uh, clearly that's not going to happen for me and no one wants to be outside without sunscreen anymore, rightfully yeah. so. So we have to find alternatives, but vitamin D is, like I said, you can get vitamin D with orange juice. It's so yeah, yeah. simple to supplement. Oh, then and maybe you don't want that sugar. <laughs> Well, that's true, right? Be careful, but th there are so many options really. And like I said, the supplements are, are also easy and come in so many forms, as you said. But you know, the scary thing is if we talk about, you know, a statistic that we talk about in the bone side is half of all women over the age of 50 will break a bone due to mm -hmm. osteoporosis in her lifetime. And a quarter of all men. It's insane that we don't pay more attention to our bone health because of that. I mean, we're looking, you know, looking at you and I, when we're over the age of 50, that's gonna, one of us, it's gonna be one of us. That's yeah. incredible to me. And so, you know, again, getting people to learn about this at a, a younger age and the importance of the younger age is that we build, there's this last, you know, talk, you know, thing talks about, we talk about building all the bone density, the strongest, densest bone we're gonna get, we build by the time we're 20, 25, yeah. right? And, and then it's the just about maintaining lives, it, right? You just want to maintain it. You maintain it. So, so when we talk about parents raising children, and my daughter's 10, almost 11, 
I'm making sure that she's getting the calcium and vitamin D and the impact exercise she needs so that she builds to peak bone mass and starts with the strongest, densest bone possible, knowing that she's going to have menopause and other things in life that might- Well, you maybe know, not. Sorry? <laughs> I said, maybe not. She's only 10. <laughs> maybe by the time she reaches- the Well, that's true. <laughs> by the time, I hope we at least prevent the fractures that are caused yeah. by osteoporosis, right? So again, just think about you know, the risk factors that you have in your family. Um, you know, what you have personally, there are on our website, the bone health and osteoporosis. So it's bonehealthandosteoporosis.org. We have all of the risk track factors, controllable and uncontrollable, many diseases that we get treatments for, unfortunately, also sap calcium and destroy our bones. Mm -hmm. So if you are a breast cancer survivor, you will most likely end up with osteoporosis, prostate cancer, yeah. diabetes treatments, um, gastrointestinal, you know, IB related issues can also lead to it. Lupus, there are so I, many things. I so was, we really yeah. need to look holistically at our, at our, at our life and think about how to protect ourselves. That's right. Every single person should be paying attention to their bone health. Um, I was shocked to learn that there's such a thing as lactation induced osteoporosis, right. Um, that can happen in young women. Me too. Me too. And it was, I remember the day I got the, a call from a woman who was breastfeeding and um, uh, found out that she started fracturing and was just completely devastated. And then she said, how, I did, how is this even possible? She goes, I can't hold my child. I have to have my mother here to help me. And it, it was really very frightening. Now that's obviously less common, um, but it does happen. And on, we have an online community for bone as well. And there's a whole section for, for younger women who have gone through uh, osteoporosis because of other conditions that have led them there. But like you said, it's, it's really incredible you know, that so many things can impact our bone health. Mm -hmm. And so if we can pay attention to it, uh, then we can, then we can manage it. And we can't cure bone disease, but we can manage it quite well. Yeah. And so that's what we need people to know. But if they don't know they have bone health issues or that they have osteoporosis, then there's no way to prevent those fractures that can be really painful and debilitating. Right. So there's a, there's a constellation of things that needs to happen. Um, there are some things that people can do on the preventative side ahead of getting osteoporosis and hopefully slowing that down or staving it off. But then on the other side, if you, if you do have osteoporosis, there's, there's a lot of different things that, that you can do in concert with your, with your care providers to um, hopefully avoid those fractures and um, maintain as much bone as possible for as long as possible. Um, you know, we work because the Buck Institute is an, it's, we're an independent research institute that's devoted to studying mechanisms of aging. And we have um, scientists from all across the spectrum. And, and, you know, one of our faculty members is actually a gerontologist, um, John Newman, and he sees patients. And when I talk to John about, you know, what, what he is most sees in his patient population among healthy older individuals, where do the problems happen? What are the, what are the things that, um, that end up leading to, um, you know, catastrophic loss of health in their, in what were otherwise healthy individuals. And it's always what he calls, you know, what, what the medical community calls frailty, um, which, you know, is a whole host of different metrics, but at the base of it, it really is just about your ability to get up and move around and not hurt yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and breaking bones is really one of the worst things that can happen to a healthy older individual. I'm um, oh, sorry. I, was just, I think no, that's please. people don't understand, you know, yeah. when, and I said to people like, I, we've talked about how to make bone health sexy, you know, and I'm like, eh, I don't know if we'll ever do that. But I do say to people, you know, as women and as we're aging, if I'm not losing my hair, I'm not losing my mind, I'm not losing my breasts, you know, for a disease, then the fact that I might fall and fracture falls way down on the list of things I'm worried about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until the fracture happens. Right. And that's what's so devastating. And when we tell people, this statistic is real. I found it when my mother broke a hip and I wasn't mm -hmm. even working at the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation yet. Um, but a quarter of all people who break a, bone, break a hip will die within the first year of that hip fracture, as we said, from deteriorating health and complications. That's that's insane, right? Say right? that again, just repeat that statistic a one more time. A quarter of all people who break a hip will die in the year following that hip fracture. And 50% will end up using an ambulatory device for the rest of their life, which means you'll have a cane or a walker. And another 25% end up going to an assisted living or a nursing home. They don't go home after a hip fracture. 
Yeah. So clearly that's the most significant fractures, but if you're breaking your ankles and your, your wrists and your back, your fractures in your back, if anyone's had a, a fracture in their back and, and have known about it, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can be silent. But when you think about old people and that curvature of the spine, like the hunch people, we call that kyphosis, that is actually fractures in the back. Mm -hmm. and it causes all kinds of problems. So if you don't want those fractures in your back and mm -hmm. you wanna be able to live independently and actively as you age, you really need to start paying attention to your bone health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we're running out of time and I wanted to, um, well, first, thank you so much for coming and telling us about these initiatives and the, and the two foundations that you're leading. I think they're, it's so important, the work that you're doing and we are really excited to work with you partner with you to direct people to your website um, and to hopefully connect women with these resources that you're building. Um, so thank you for joining us, Claire. Yeah, my pleasure. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pivot to the chat and ask um, some of the questions that came in. So um, one question was, can you speak more about alcohol's effect on osteoporosis? Yeah. So um, alcohol consumption is uh, does impact bone, but I have to say it's a little bit of a funny statistic when we say it. Um, the the level of consumption that impacts you is after three drinks a day. So I kind of say to people, if if you're consuming three alcoholic beverages a day, osteoporosis might not be <laughs> the problem you have. But it doesn't impact your bone oh. until you, unless your consumption is at about you know two to three drink, drinks a day, in which case then you are in, you know impacting bone. Smoking, any yeah. type of smoking, smoking, cease it for a yeah. number of reasons. Same things for ovarian health, like smoking, anything that affects your overall you know uh, rate of aging things like smoking, um, if it accelerates your overall rate of aging, it almost certainly is having an effect on your, on your ovarian, rate of ovarian aging yeah. and bone health as well. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I missed the episode with the HRT telemedicine startup. Ah, which episode is that? Um, so that was an episode where I had on um, Alicia Jackson, who is the CEO of a company called Evernow. Um, and uh, her um, uh, CTO, Aaron Gottwald, and actually he's the only man who's ever been a guest on OVA. <laughs> so really? he has, yeah, he has that distinction. Um, but they talked about um, Evernow and what they're trying to do for women. And, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to get HRT. I wouldn't want to say that that's the only option. Um, but in terms of, you know, companies that are trying to personalize things and really work individually with the patients, I, I think they're doing a spectacular job. Um, and, and it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, episode. Um, let's see, uh, why is this called over hour? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, you know, the, the reproductive longevity and equality initiatives that we have at the Buck Institute, the center and the global consortium, these are both based around the idea that we want to understand what, what leads to what's the causal factor or cue or constellation of cues and factors that lead to um, such a reproducible decline in a woman's ovarian function that starts, you know, early. So ovaries are aging at about two and a half times the rate of the tissue in the rest of the body. So they're aging prematurely and we want to understand why. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a canonical graph that everyone is familiar with at some level, which is just the number of eggs that a woman has over time and the quality of those eggs. So over time, the number and quality of eggs declines. Um, and you know, when we run out of eggs and ovaries stop working, that's what we define as menopause. Um, and ova is just another way to say egg or oocyte. So um, that's why we call it over hour. <laughs> um, let's see, I am postmenopausal age 77. Uh, what do I need to know about my bone health at my age? Um, uh, well, again, it depends on a couple of things. As I said, if you've um, never fractured a bone, then great, and you're doing well, but everyone over the age of 65 is eligible through Medicare to get a bone density test. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't had one, you should get a baseline and find out you know, where you are, and that will help you determine, again, you, uh, you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D to maintain that bone health. Um, if you have had a fracture, then I really encourage you to talk with your doctor about what you can do to prevent future fractures. And that might require treatment. And I know people don't like to be on treatment these days, but again, it's that risk equation that we talked about. You know, what is your risk of breaking a hip 
and potentially dying within the first year? And what is your risk of having a rare side effect from a treatment? And mm -hmm. you know, I try to remind people aspirin has side effects, right? We, That's we, right. We really need to look at that as a risk equation. So, um, but again, if you haven't fractured and you, you know, haven't had any kind of uh, pain or, or symptoms in your back that might be exposed to like a, a back fracture, then terrific. And for many, you might just need to maintain that, that bone health and doing what you're doing. The good, healthy eating and exercise could, could be all you need, but definitely check on your calcium and vitamin D levels with your clinician. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, in terms of those bone scans, uh, the standard of care right now, as we said, there's not really a standard of care for perimenopause, but um, it, there is some evidence that having a baseline scan before you, your ovaries stop working might be a good idea. Um, can you talk about that at all? Yeah, unfortunately, like you said, it's really dependent on um, the clinician that you have and whether or not he or she knows how to get that covered by your insurance. Mm -hmm. um, it can be, like I said, it's 65 and above, it's absolutely covered. For anyone younger than that, it really depends on your risk factors. But again, if you are seeing a clinician and you tell them my mother you know, had a hip fracture or my grandmother did, et cetera, or I've had, I'm a breast cancer survivor, or I have mm -hmm. these kind of conditions, then the doctor should be able to check off off on a list of things that say you're at higher risk, you know, at a younger age and need to get a baseline. Mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind, but again, this is an equal equality issue is the, the DEXA test is only about a hundred something dollar, about a hundred dollars. So for, uh, you know, for some people, they can afford to get the test because they, mm -hmm. you know, want to pay for it and find out where they are. But I, like I said, in most cases, you can find a clinician who will determine based on your risk factor, whether or not you should have that baseline DEXA. And there's a lot of conditions that would allow you to have that baseline DEXA early. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, what are your thoughts on egg freezing and IVF treatments and the risk of disease down the line? Is there an increased risk? So I think I can speak to this a little bit. Um, this is a little bit outside of what we were talking about today, but um, egg freezing and IVF treatments both require um, hormonal stimulation cycles to, to retrieve the eggs. And um, we really don't have a good picture. This is my answer to a lot of questions about women's reproductive health. Um, we really don't have a good picture of how that affects um, women in the long term. Um, it's it's highly possible that you know having these uh, very strong stimulatory cycles um, are probably not good for your ovaries, but. Um, I think I would say that the data right now is preliminary. This is this is why we we have funded the the consortium. You know why we're why we're giving away grants to basic scientists because there's a huge there's just a huge amount of information that we don't know at a scientific level that we can know. It's not unknowable. <laughs> we just need the scientists to do the work. And as a scientist myself, I can't do research unless I have unless I have funding to do it. It doesn't matter if I think it's the most important problem in the world. Um, so that's why we're funding grants um, in the space. And we are looking for people to help us support that. And whether that means you know philanthropic dollars or just being an ambassador, talking about what we're doing here, talking about what Claire's doing, um, sharing information with your, your friends and your family and your, your cohort of people that are in your sphere. Um, we have a website, which we'll put up here at the end. We have um, an online uh, a white paper that describes what we're doing. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources there. And we would, be, we would be really grateful if you would consider yourselves ambassadors and, and tell other people about what we're doing so that we can push this forward faster. That's really the goal is to, to get the answers to these questions so that we can then translate those basic discoveries at, at the bench in the lab into products and diagnostics um, and therapeutics for women. So with that, I will say thank you, Claire, for joining us. And um, thank you all for listening. Um, and we'll see you next month.